Hi, everybody. Welcome. Sorry, I still had the mute on. I'm Mark Hertzgard. I'm the executive director of Covering Climate Now and the environment correspondent at The Nation magazine. Welcome to another talking shop with Covering Climate Now. And today our topic, as you all know, is covering COP27 from afar or on site. For those who don't know, Covering Climate Now is a global media collaboration of more than 500 news outlets with a total audience of some 2 billion people. We're organized by journalists for journalists to help all of us do a better job on the defining story of our time. It costs nothing to join us. You can go to our website, sign up for our weekly newsletter, join the Slack channel, check out our reporting resources, apply to join Covering Climate Now if you'd like. We'd also like to invite everyone to watch the one hour TV special, Burning Questions, that we've produced. And this will feature the winners of the 2022 Covering Climate Now Journalism Awards, including all three of our panelists today. Burning Questions is the title of the TV special. It will be co-hosted by our colleagues, Al Roker and Savannah Sellers of NBC News. It will broadcast and stream on public television stations across the United States on the World Channel. That's next Tuesday night, October 25, 8 p.m. Eastern time. And after that, it will be streaming on our site at Covering Climate Now. So COP27 takes place in Egypt, November 6 to November 18. And at this stage of the climate emergency, every international climate negotiation like these COPs is newsworthy. And our role at the press as the press is to inform the public about what does and does not happen at these negotiations and to hold governments accountable by making it clear that the world is watching. Today's Talking Shop aims to help all journalists cover this story, whether you're reporting from Egypt, on the ground, or remotely via the United Nations video feed. And to be clear, you do not need formal press accreditations to cover COP27 remotely. And if you uh, want to cover it on site, you've already missed the date to get accreditation. So um, you can look, uh, we're going to put into the chat the uh, the link to the COP27 website, and there you will find everything you need to get access to the video feeds. So this is the first COP to take place in Africa, and age-old issues of rich and poor will be center stage, as they often are. Rich countries are legally obligated under the Paris Agreement to provide $100 billion a year in climate aid to the world's poorer countries to help them transition away from fossil fuels and to build resilience against the extreme weather that is increasingly striking them now. Rich countries have never fulfilled that obligation, not even close. So what we're seeing recently is some of the highly vulnerable climate countries are threatening what amounts to a debt strike. They are threatening not to pay the debt that they owe, hundreds of millions, billions rather, of dollars that they owe to the rich countries until the rich countries come across with their obligation uh, to help with climate aid to those poor countries who, of course, had very little to do with causing the climate crisis in the first place. A second key question at COP27 is going to be, how much freedom will climate activists have to speak out, given the Egyptian government's longstanding repression of dissent? Writing last week in The Intercept, our colleague Naomi Klein reported that there are some 60,000 political prisoners behind bars in Egypt, including the democracy activist Allah Abd El Fattah, and he is wasting away right now in the middle of a hunger strike. Check out Naomi Klein's article in The Intercept again. One role of the press at these kinds of conferences is to show governments that the world is watching. Finally, will the world's two leading climate superpowers, China and the United States, rise above their many other disagreements and resume joint efforts at COP at climate stabilization? Likewise, how will European nations deal with the energy crisis caused by Russia's continuing aggression in Ukraine? So lots to talk about, including how our reporting can center the human consequences of all this geopolitical maneuvering. And I've got to say, we've got an absolutely stellar group of panelists to join us. I'll introduce all three of them at once, and I'll be questioning them during the first half hour here. Then in the second half, your questions, which you're welcome to submit via chat. We've had some come in over the RSVPs. Always more questions arise during the session. Please post them in the chat. We'll get to as many as possible. You're also welcome to tweet throughout the hour using at covering, sorry, at covering climate and the hashtag CC now. 
Now, please join me in giving a very warm virtual welcome to our panelists. As I mentioned, all of them happen to be winners of the 2022 Covering Climate Now Journalism Awards and appear in the Burning Questions TV special next Tuesday, October 25. Carolyn Beeler. Carolyn is the environment correspondent and editor at the public radio news program, The World. She's reported from all seven continents about the impacts of climate change and efforts to address the problem. And in addition to her Covering Climate Now Award, she has also won two Edward R. Murrow Awards. Nicholas Hock. Nick is a roving news correspondent for Al Jazeera based in Dakar, Senegal. He started reporting for Al Jazeera in 2008 in Bangladesh, his home country. He's also worked for the BBC, Channel 4 News UK, ITS, and ABC News in London. And Langia Poidi, Sherelle Jackson. She is the Climate Collaborations Editor for the Associated Press. She's a Samoan native and a longtime journalist covering climate and environmental issues in the Pacific Islands. She's worked at The Guardian, or I should say for The Guardian, Agence France Press, and the New Zealand Herald, and she was the editor of the Pacific Environment Weekly. So welcome, one and all. Let's get right into it. Nick, uh, you're based in Africa, as I mentioned, Western Africa, Senegal, and your piece that won the Covering Climate Now uh, Journalism Award this year, I thought just brilliantly connected climate change and migration, reporting how the intensifying storms and droughts and other extreme weather uh, that we're seeing in so many parts of the world, in the case of Senegal, they're driving young men to attempt that very perilous trek across the desert, across the Mediterranean to Europe in search of employment. You, I understand, are gonna be reporting on COP27 from Egypt, from Sharm el-Sheikh. So what stories are you most planning to explore while you're there? So just to correct, I'm, I won't be in Egypt, but we will be covering it from okay. Africa. And I think something really important to remember, this is quite an extraordinary moment to have this COP conference happening away from rich countries and like you know Copenhagen or Glasgow but in on the continent where people are affected by climate change so that's really a historical moment for a lot of people in Africa to see that to see polluting countries and polluting leaders come on the continent to make very important decisions but as you mentioned this is happening in Egypt a country that has a long history of clamping down on dissent and on protest, a very short history of democracy. And so it'll be interesting to see if people will be going out to protest. Usually when you go to these conferences, whether it be in Paris and Glasgow, you have all these protests and, and that's part of the show. It's like the icebreaker, um, no pun intended for, 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 this, for this event. Now, will this take place in Egypt? And will the voices of people who are affected by climate change on the continent be heard? Those are two big questions, I think, for people uh, on the ground. And of course, there, there are immediate repercussions of what's happening with climate change when it comes to people moving. And we've had a terrible, terrible rainy season. It's still going on and people are being displaced. And when we're talking about people being displaced, we're not talking about hundreds of people's or hundreds of thousands of people. We're talking about millions of people affected by the floods and that have been on the move, not just in Africa, but also in Asia. So there's a lot at stake in this conference. And we also have to remember that whilst there's a lot at stake, there's a big question on whether those being affected by climate change will have a voice in this conference. So Nick, just to follow up quickly, how do you at Al Jazeera and your colleagues plan to try and give those people a voice? The protesters, the people who are not- Okay, so there's several. Yeah, so just, just to put frame back Egypt, you know, this is a country where, you know, protesting is, is criminalized. It's very difficult to, to demonstrate in that country. Not only that, they go after people on social media on, under loose morality laws. They've gone after women and influencer. And so even, you're on so even if you're on social media and you're in Egypt and you want to voice something against maybe the Egyptians government uh, uh, role in, in, in exacerbating climate change, well, that's a risk. 
And, and it, it's a risk because human rights organizations, whether it be Human Rights Watch or Amnesty, have long documented the fact that the Egyptian authorities have a, a record of extrajudicial killings, torture, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's really important to follow the conversation beyond the borders of Egypt in the rest of the world and to support those that are in Egypt trying to make those, th those voices or those important points made because those, those kind of protests that we see, we think, haha, it's really funny, et cetera, around the protests have a real impact on the days of these events and, and pressuring governments to, to, you know, to, to protect the planet, essentially. So, I mean, at Al Jazeera, what we're gonna do, we're, obviously we're gonna be trying to cover, as some of you know, we have a long history with the Egyptian authorities and some of our journalists have been in prison. Um, things have calmed down a tad bit, I would say, but um, there will be coverage of what's happening on the ground, but also more importantly, what's happening on the continent, and, and more importantly, what is the what are the African or Asian countries, or the ones that have been really affected by climate change? What are their position, and how are they going to speak um, from one voice? So, whilst you know we might have an anchor talking on the ground, my job is to relate it to the reality of what's happening. So, there's going to be a lot of words, but what what's actually happening on the ground? What are the fallout effects? So we'll be following, for instance. Um, you know this after the Paris Agreement. There's been a lot of talk about uh, the you going away from fossil fuels and alternative energy, and that was in 2015. The Paris Agreement. Where are we now? And what has recent effect, uh, events affected or changed the dynamics? And I'm alluding to the Russia-Ukraine war. This need for you know powering people's homes and people keeping people warm in Europe. Will this be? at the detriment of people in Africa that have oil rich countries or, or countries where there's a lot of gas, like Senegal, where there's a lot of gas resources. And suddenly we've seen um, heads of states from Germany and France coming over, you know, opening up these big solar panel farms, but at the same time saying, I'd like a piece of that, of that natural gas that you have off your coast. So what, what, what's, what are the effects on the fishermen there, on the nature there? And that's something that we'll be talking about. Thanks, Nick. That's Nick Hawk of Al Jazeera. And it's been quite almost humorous to watch how uh, leaders from Europe have suddenly said, hey, Senegal, how's it going? We're so happy to see you. And so one of the things in our coverage, let's make sure that we don't just talk about how the, the very accurate situation that, that, yes, Europeans are going to be facing a tough winter because of, of gas shortages. Let's remember that that condition exists in various permutations around the world, at least as acutely. And let's pay as much attention to that as we do to Europe. Now to Carolyn Beeler. So Carolyn, you and I were together in Glasgow at COP26, and uh, you you your winning piece for us in the Covering Climate and Journalism Awards uh, partly was about how you shadowed a negotiator for Palau, I believe it was, a nation of low-lying islands in the Pacific uh, where rising seas are literally an existential threat. So what advice do you have uh, for reporters who may be not able to be in Egypt, but still want to help their audiences understand the importance of these negotiations as they are following them remotely? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the key question, really. How can we bring the news that's happening in this conference center um, with tons of journalists and, you know, people in suits often to, you know, the, the, the places that are actually impacted by, by climate change, you know, showing, showing the impact. So at Glas in Glasgow, I was in, in Glasgow, but I made sure in two stories to um, be able to really tell the story of what was happening in other places in, you know, while I was in Glasgow. So I ahead of time set up um, this, this shadowing of a climate negotiator from a vulnerable nation to shadow him for the day and really get him to reflect on what was happening in his own country, what the stakes were as he was sitting at those negotiating tables. Um, so he could describe sort of what he was fighting for and how that fight was, was working. So that's one strategy. Um, you could you could do that remotely um, if you wanted to. You could identify somebody ahead of time that you wanted to follow and just check in with them over phone or Zoom or Skype. You know, throughout the conference, if you're a you know a, a local reporter, a national reporter, a negotiator that represents your 
your readership or listenership. Um, another thing that I did last year um, for Glasgow was, you know, I really wanted to be able to show or or illustrate um, orally for for our, our radio listeners sort of what the impacts were looking like. So I connected with a colleague of mine, Halima Gakande, who's based in Africa and was doing some reporting on drought. Um, in Kenya and um, had her, you know, talk to some folks, um, some um, folks about the experience they, they had of drought and losing livestock. So I used that example to tell the story of the loss and damage negotiations, but I actually used sound that she gathered uh, ahead of the summit and wove that into a story that I mostly then reported from the conference center in Glasgow. So that was, again, prep work done ahead of time that allowed me to feature the voices of people who were really impacted. Um, so those are those are two things you know you could do if you were there, and you could also do remotely, right? If you plan to cover, um, you know, the the conversations about um, loss and damage this year, adaptation, you could do reporting ahead of time of a community that's going to need to raise all of its roads, so it's not impacted by, um, you know, they're they're not flooded when sea levels rise another five inches, um, and be able to you know float that into your coverage of the negotiations that are happening um, on. Um, adaptation funding, for example. Um, uh, yeah, so so it's often about prep work and figuring out what your stories are going to be ahead of time and preparing in that way. Um, and then also making the connections so that you can, you know, all the negotiations are closed, people talk in press conferences afterward, but making the, the connections with negotiators and other people, you know, you're going to need to get information from um, ahead of time so that you know you can tap tap them for, for information. Um, yeah. So that's something uh, that first idea you mentioned, Carolyn, about connecting with colleagues uh, in other countries in advance. That's something that we are covering climate now would be very happy to help folks with. As I mentioned, we have almost 500 news outlets around the world who are part of covering climate now. Most of them are not going to be able to spend the money, frankly, to send reporters to uh, Egypt, but they can do the kind of reporting that Carolyn just talked about that can that can then be combined into others who are reporting uh, either from the site or remotely. Now, again, Carolyn, you and I were both there last year. Can you just talk to folks who may think, oh gosh, if I'm not there on site, um, I'm gonna miss so much. But, you know, as you just said, the negotiations happen behind closed doors. And basically we as reporters on site you know, we, we listen to the press conferences that they give afterwards. And all of that, as I understand it, is going to be available on the UN uh, video feeds that anyone can watch from Arkansas or Alaska or uh, Tokyo or wherever. So can you just speak a little bit to that? Are, should, should journalists who aren't going to be there on site, do they really have to, uh, to worry about kind of missing the story? Definitely not. I think, you know, there are a lot of journalists that cover these. And so uh, there are already a lot of people telling the kinds of stories that that are easier to get or can only be gotten um, from the summit. And and the real story of climate change is happening everywhere else, right? <laughs> the real story of climate change is not happening in the conference center. It's happening uh, in much more sort of human and textured ways everywhere else. So, you know, it's very important that we have journalists who are who are you know holding power to account? Who are there in the room to be able to document what's happening? It is easier to chase down sources and get them to talk to you, and you can just like literally stick a mic in their face. Um, but you know the reality of of what's happening with climate change is happening everywhere else, and so you know showing the stakes of of, of what's going on is much easier maybe in your home community or if you take a reporting trip ahead of the COP. Um, so you know you tell you saw slightly different stories, but you know I've been a focused on climate change since Paris and, uh, you know, full-time climate reporter since Paris. And I've only been to climate summits since then. So it's not, you know, essential that you, you go, that you be there in person um, to be able to attend these summits. You know, the, the one thing that is easier, like I said, is tracking down sources, getting people to talk to you. So that's about sourcing and, and developing those sources over time and ahead of time. So they'll, you know, maybe answer your WhatsApp message when you, when you ask them a question. Thanks, that's Carolyn Beeler of the uh, National Public Radio Program, The World. And now I'm going to turn to uh, Langi Poiva, uh, Sherelle Jackson. Uh, uh, Langi, you're, the, the story that you did, which was for The Guardian, that won the Carbon Climate Now Journalism Award this year, that also focused on the challenges that we're facing, that are facing uh, Pacific Islanders like yourself, like your family, um, as climate change intensifies. Uh, 
My understanding is that you're living in the States. So how do you plan uh, to continue to highlight those kinds of stories that you so brilliantly evoked in that, uh, in that Guardian piece? Uh, how will you be doing that as part of your COP27 coverage? And also, if you could speak about your other colleagues at the Associated Press, how they are approaching this, this story. Thank you, Mark, um, and thank you to Covering Climate Now for this opportunity to highlight some of the work that I've been doing um, at the Associated Press and The Guardian. Uh, well, great question. <laughs> I've been in the US for two years now, um, but the majority of my journalism career was in the Pacific Islands um, in Samoa. And so when I speak about this issue and talk about my coverage, it's really from the local newsroom perspective and in languages that are not English. So um, that's where I come from in terms of covering COPs for the past, uh, since COP14, which was in um, Poland. Now, you know, this issue of like uh, doing justice to the story on the ground uh, while remotely covering, that's it's so important. I don't think we should be hindered by the fact that we're not in country or on location um, to cover the story effectively. Um, as long as we maintain our sources and have our contacts on the ground and in our communities, um, and I'm speaking to developing country journalists who have closer ties to their communities, um, you know, those sources that you have, those stories that you know, the life that you grew up in, that is the strength of the climate story. Um, using those narratives that you grew up in and tying it to the climate story, tying it to covering uh, leading up to COP27, that's the strongest way you can uh, bring in the human face of, of climate change. So my advice would be to really root the story of climate leading up to COP27 in your experiences, um, you know, from your community, and then elevate that through whatever delegation that your country is sending to, to COP27. That's a very interesting point, Langi, that your delegation, your country's delegation. So how does one, as a reporter, uh, we've got what, about three weeks now before the opening day, a little more than that, three and a half weeks, I guess, uh, before the opening day of uh, COP27, which by chance <laughs> falls right before the U.S. midterm elections. Um, but how does a reporter make contact in advance with the country delegation? Do you have any sort of really practical tips on how to do that and how to convince them that it's going to convince the source that is that it's going to be worthwhile to, to talk to you? Sure, Mark. So first of all, you did ask about my colleagues at the AP and our uh, coverage planning. We are sending, uh, so first, before I answer that question, we are sending a team um, to COP27 of our global climate desk. Um, so there will be some very strong coverage, which also includes long serving um, AP veterans, climate, you know, climate and science writers from the AP. So there will be some really good coverage um, by us on, on at the COP. So, but in terms of that question of contacting <clears throat> country delegations, so we're fortunate in the Pacific Islands, uh, we are very close to our government delegations in that we're either related, friends, someone dated someone, someone went to school with someone. So it's a lot easier to create those contacts um, to illustrate that uh, kind of fluidity and contacts, um, sorry, in, in the network, I have held badges, all badges, um, I've gone as a delegate, I've gone as an NGO, as observer. So it's much easier for Pacific Island journalists to gain access to the negotiations than say someone from the US, uh, a journalist from the US. So in that way, uh, in climate, in a very rare, rare occasion, Pacific Islanders are more privileged um, in terms of access to the negotiations. Um, and these contacts, uh, again, I'll speak to, to journalists who are from, you know, maybe Asia Pacific uh, communities. Um, you already, you build these contacts over time. Um, and I've always found that the negotiators are, you know, are, are more easier to approach if you build that trust over time. Now, uh, for Samoa's lead climate negotiator, she's actually my sister's uh, classmate. So it's kind of unfair because, you know, that president, that, that relationship was built before me. But my advice would be follow the work of negotiators way before any COP. Get to know them, get to know their work 
talk to the scientists, the IPCC scientists from your country, um, get to know the, the experts from your country that will participate. It's really important that you stick to your own country and community when covering COP because you cannot cover the big story all the time. Now, to, this is really to the smaller local newsroom with limited capacity. Be realistic in the way that you're covering COP. Don't try, if you're on site, don't try to cover all the press conferences. Focus in on the issue that you want to cover and concentrate on that. Of course, there will be celebrity speakers and all of that, but if they don't match up to the story that you're trying to cover, don't waste your time, um, but make sure that you're doing due justice to the stance of your countries in that follow what they're doing. Um, in the Pacific, uh, Pacific negotiators, my favorite thing to do is to check at plenary, opening plenary, if they're sitting behind the flags. If they're not, either they missed a flight, they slept in because they're jet lagged, or something else has happened. But that's a very basic thing as uh, small island developing journalists you know, can do. I know I veered off the question, Mark, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, no, no. I, think, I think you answered it quite well, if I may say so. Uh, I do know that that let's drill down a little bit more on this. And Nick, I want to turn to you. I, I see there's already questions in the chat and we've gotten some on RSVP. Um, everyone, all three of you have kind of said that we need to be able to connect what happens in Egypt to local stories in your community. Nick, that's an interesting challenge for Al Jazeera because you report literally to a global audience. Um, so how many other reporters like yourself will be uh, feeding coverage into Al Jazeera's general coverage from how many different countries? I mean, you're, you're there in West Africa. Is, is, does Al Jazeera plan to have a whole lot of other reporters, say from Brazil, where there's a very important election coming now with huge climate implications? Will they be part of your coverage, et cetera? Well, I think as, as the panelist has mentioned, I mean, this is a global issue affecting local communities. And so there will be correspondence in Brazil or in Europe, in Holland or elsewhere covering the, the event. And it's not so much, I mean, it is important, I think, for those that can to go to Egypt because there is such a, a high level of repression. So it's interesting to have that opportunity. It gives, it, it's almost an excuse for people to go and visit Egypt and maybe do other stories there at the same time. And, and it's also important, I think, to cover if there are protests around the, the COP27, then it's really important to be on the ground and to cover those protests. But like, like the panelists said, so much of the story is not in Egypt. It's the reaction to what's happening in Egypt, right? It's how, what are the fallout reactions to people who are in Liberia, in Monrovia, where we've seen, when, you know, when a couple of weeks ago I was there and there was just water rising on her in, in these places that are historical sites. So, you know, if, I don't know, if some head of state or Antonio Guterres says something, I want to, I want to point my camera and my microphone to the person that's living in Monrovia and to see what he has, what is his reaction to it. And, and often you get the most amazing sound bites when you do that. When you say, well, this is what this person is saying. How do you feel about it? And so much you know, of my medium is, you know, you, you can read about what's happening, you can be on social media, but for me, it's about what it feels and what it's like on the ground. What does it feel like to be, um, you know, in a village where you're seeing the water coming, coming in? And, and how is that? And, and, and whilst you see that your, 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 your home is being destroyed, how do you feel about these people who are jetting away in Egypt and talking, you know, drinking whatever drink they are drinking and talking about their lives. I think that's really important. And I just wanted to, to, to react to, to what a, one, of, one of my fellow panelists said about you know, local contacts and, and trying to get to, your, to, to those that are defending or that will be at the conference, you know, the, 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 the delegations. I, I thought that it was really difficult. You know, I'm, you know, whilst, whilst I, my parents are from Bangladesh, I'm actually from France. I was born in France. And so I thought it was really difficult when I was in Bangladesh to actually reach out to those that were representing Bangladesh's interests. I realized that sometimes 
in, in, in the local context, it's often more difficult for, for the locals to get the reaction of their own heads of government. It's easier for someone from the outside, from the United States or from Europe, to get a hold of these people, to get that, to, to get those relationships going. So it is a really, really big challenge for local journalists to cover this, this event. And I think we need to, to honor that and to be aware of that, us who are in a privileged situation to speak to a global audience, to revert back to those local stories. You know, I was speaking to, to a local report, reporter from Charleston, uh, South Carolina yesterday, and we realized that him and I, I'm in Dakar, Senegal, we have so much in common in our stories. Those local stories that are happening in Charleston, South Carolina, are the same ones that are happening in Dakar. And if I go further, they're the same one that were happening in, on the coast of Bangladesh. So those local stories that are global are the ones that we need to be saying. And, and so local journalists in their local newsroom shouldn't shy away from, um, from conflict and trying to fight their ground to tell those stories that might be really, really small, but have that maybe have an impact to someone that's across the globe that's sharing the same kind of challenges or same stories. That is so much about what Covering Climate Now tries to facilitate, to build a community of journalists around the world who are covering climate change. And the more we talk with one another, as Nick just mentioned, talking to a colleague in South Carolina who also was one of the winners of our uh, awards this year, the more we realize that a lot of these stories are very similar around the world. Uh, it's the rich who cause the problem. It's the poor who endure it. It's uh, the white people, the white privileged people who generally make the decisions and the rest of the world who have to live with those decisions. And our role in media is to bring that out and to try and, and always center equity in our reporting, equity and compassion. Carolyn, I wanna follow up on that point with you. Um, and again, remember when we were in Glasgow last year and we arranged covering through covering climate now a an interview with uh, Mohammed Nasheed, who is the former president of uh, the Maldives, but was there as the Global South ambassador to COP27. Nasheed is also the spokesperson for what I mentioned earlier, this uh, basically threatened death strike on the part of uh, some of the highly climate vulnerable countries in the world, uh, saying we're not going to pay the money that we owe to Western banks. You guys haven't paid us the climate aid that you have owed literally since 2020 uh, and before. So it, could you talk a little bit about that, Carolyn? I mean, is that is that the kind of thing, this this uh, threatened debt strike, is that the kind of thing that, that uh, you would see reporting on for the world, for example? And if so, how would you go about it and with an eye towards how others could also be covering that story in their own uh, newsrooms? Yeah, I mean, um... I think the 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 topic of um, debt and a lot of like the proposals that, for example, Mia Motley uh, and from Barbados Barbados is is forwarding, and also um, Prime Minister Brown in Antigua and Barbuda, they're all talking about this issue of debt and um, debt for you know. We, there's a bunch of sort of financial um, products that are being raised about how to how to deal deal with this, and yeah, I mean. Um, so I spoke with Prime Minister Brown at a UN climate at a the UN um, General Assembly um, a couple of years ago about his you know basically his argument that there needs to be more fiscal space and there needs to be you know easier borrowing terms for countries that are on the receiving end of the most climate damages and don't necessarily have what they call the fiscal space to deal with it. Um, so I think that's an, this is an interesting emerging story that is kind of a little bit, you know, different from some of the um, stories that take us on the ground and uh, show us impacts and show us specific adaptations. But this, this sort of, I think what's interesting about this is, you know, this idea that the whole global financial system is not working for developing countries for climate vulnerable countries and the idea that you know we need to, that that there's an, an argument that that all needs to be uh, overturned um so you know it's a, it's a challenging story to tell for radio or i would imagine tv because um it's an idea it's um so you know you could you could I've, I've kind of reported a bit on this and used exa specific examples of specific infrastructure that has been 
for example, in um, Antigua that's been destroyed and then there was not uh, a, the ability to borrow to build it back better, stronger, more resilient um, in the time frame that it was needed. So they end up getting into more debt because they had to buy, borrow privately to rebuild this road, I think, to build it higher to withstand future flooding rather than being able to borrow at a concessional rate because there's some sort of, you know, because of, there's more availability of adaptation finance. So it's kind of a little bit different than the question you asked, Mark, but for radio and, and, and I imagine TV, you have to be able to find the specific examples of, you know, this is the problem and this is how it, you would fix it um, with a sort of on the ground example that you can see or hear. Um, so, yeah, I think I think those are all really interesting topics to consider. They're kind of a new area that world leaders are highlighting in terms of the financial system. I think that also ties in, Carolyn, with the whole question of how much protest is going to be allowed in Egypt. Because I remember at Glasgow, and I was there at, at Paris and, and Copenhagen before that too, uh, oftentimes it's the protesters in the streets who are raising these issues, who are saying, wait, there's a bigger context to climate change. And it's a context of unfair debt uh, uh, and, and a, an unfair global economic system that all of these conversations about climate change take place within that larger context. And when you as a reporter uh, can go to those protests and find the person who's carrying that sign that says, you know, debt relief is, is or, 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 or debt is, is, uh, is uh, oppressing the people of the global South, that's a way for you to get a sound bite and to bring that in and to have a little, let's face it, some, some sort of color and drama in your, your story. So we've gotten a number of questions about this. I'm going to segue to this. Uh, Lange, I'm going to start with you. Uh, one of the big, big questions that, of course, is going to be center stage at COP27 is so-called loss and damage. And let's be really clear about what that is and why it's emerging now. There's loss and damage is not adaptation. Everybody knows, I think, on this call, climate mitigation, that's about lowering the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, especially by stopping emitting so many. Uh, adaptation is adapting to the impacts that are already happening, building stronger seawalls, creating uh, early warning systems, which uh, the United Nations just pointed out last week. Most of the world's population are still not protected by the early warning systems that we in the rich world take for granted. The reason that we knew that Hurricane Ian was going to strike uh, southwestern Florida, and we knew it pretty long in advance, is because of those systems. Most of the world doesn't have that. That's an example of adaptation. Loss and damage is different. Loss and damage is essentially, it's not quite exactly the same as reparations, but it is compensation. It is saying on the part of the global south, look, you guys in the rich world, you cause these problems. They are affecting us and we are losing and being damaged. We are losing things permanently. Somebody who dies in a flood uh, because of climate change, they're not coming back. Uh, the kinds of damage that can happen to a community, you, you need compensation for that. So that's the argument at, that will be raised at uh, COP27. The United States administration has already made it clear they are not interested in having that. Uh, conversation. So, uh, Lange, I'd like you to talk a little bit, again, from the perspective of someone who, you know, is from the Pacific Islands, now reporting for the Associated Press. How do you guys plan to ventilate that crucial issue of loss and damage at COP27? Thank you, Mark. Well, I think it's, um, I'm not going to speak to how my colleagues will cover this because they will be doing due justice to how the story unfolds uh, in, in Egypt. But of course, um, with the AP's climate coverage, it is about, you know, uh, reflecting the voices that are there and really giving voice as well to, to developing countries in the global south. Um, Again, I'm just seeing a lot of chatter from, from colleagues in Africa region and, and developing countries. So I really want to speak to, to how we as journalists cover this issue when you're on the ground or off site on loss and damage. Loss and damage continues to be one of these issues that is championed by developing countries. Uh, small island developing states have taken a very strong stance on it that is not equivalent to their contribution um, to, to emissions. And Mike, you have you know, accurately 
um, defined these terms, uh, you know, as it relates to loss and damage. And no, it's not reparations, but it is very close to it. It is compensation. And with each uh, region, so Africa, Pacific, Caribbean, there is that one high emitting country that is responsible to them, or rather that claims responsibility for that Pacific for that specific region. So for the Pacific Islands, it's Australia, it's New Zealand. Um, so my advice to journalists who are covering COP27 would be to focus in on those countries that are relevant to your region, um, because that way you can make the story a lot more relatable and it's a lot more, it's easier for you to cover in terms of data and information that you have on the ground. So. You know, this issue continues to be one um, that needs more coverage from COP27, uh, both on site and off site. Um, and really what we need to see more of is not necessarily the voices of the global south that are continued, uh, that continue to be marginalized when we get to the discussion of the Warsaw, um, of the whim, but we need to see which countries are blocking it and highlight the reasons for blocking it and the tactic, tactics that they're using and how those positions, and I speak here for Australia, how those positions translate um, to their intentions in countries. So for instance, with Australia, it's all about big brother supporting small island developing uh, states. But when it comes to the negotiations, it's a different story. So just looking at like the dichotomy between expressions of support at the community level and then the true support at the global level and how they're blocking negotiations at the, uh, you know, at the demise, the future demise of, of, of island nations and developing countries. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I can offer for now, Mark, on that one. Unless we have an hour, in which case we can continue. <laughs> uh, excellent point. It's not enough to just explain why loss and damage is, is an issue. Look at who is blocking it. In that regard, a very specific soundbite that you might all want to look at. I'm not sure if we can call it up quickly enough here in the chat, but because uh, I didn't give my colleagues a heads up about this. But John Kerry, of course, the U.S. Special Climate Envoy, said uh, in New York last month, in fact, I was there in the room as he said this, uh, at a New York Times event, he was pressed uh, by a representative from, I forget, but but one uh, Global South country who was pushing for loss and damage. And he reacted quite strongly, almost angrily. And just so you know what his position is, he said, look, um, the most important thing we can spend money on is mitigation. In other words, bringing down the temperature. He says, if we don't do that right, we are croaked, absolutely croaked. That was the word he used, croaked, which for those of you who are maybe- A very not, aggressive word. Now, with American English, croak is a slang for dying. Yeah. Croaked, right? We are croaked, he said. And then we have money that we have to spend for adaptation. We cannot also spend on compensation. You're talking about trillions of dollars. Look at how we, the Biden administration, just had to pass climate legislation on Capitol Hill without a single Republican vote. You think you can get a trillion dollars for this? Kerry continued, good luck, unquote. So that's the US position. I'm not defending it or advancing it. I'm just saying that's the biggest uh, government in the world is pushing against loss and damage. That is a position to interrogate as we go forward, all of us as reporters on that crucial issue of loss and damage. Nick Hawk, do you have any further thoughts on this about how uh, all of us as reporters can be, can be pursuing these themes? Well, I think for me, it's really important to go beyond the easy narrative, right, that we already have about climate change and, and look in more specific terms what, like the panelists have said, like what each countries are actually doing or defending. So I'll give you a very concrete example. In Senegal, uh, President Macky Sall, who's the head of the African Union, talks about climate justice. And he's been using this word for the last year extensively. But what does that mean? to him. Well, for him, climate justice means the ability to extract fossil fuel, liquid natural gas out of the oceans of the coast of Senegal in order to bring power and electricity to homes where there is no power and electricity. So 70% of the population there 
don't have access to power. And for him, that is climate justice. Now, climate justice for someone, I guess, in the island nations, or maybe in the United States, in South Carolina means something completely different. So, you know, it's already a very complex event, COP27. So I think we really need to look at specifics and what each country wants and what they're saying and what are the fallout effect on that. The other thing that I, I want to point out too is, unfortunately, what I've seen is, is there are countries that use climate change as a veneer and, and, and it's a way for them to get the attention or get funds from rich countries and, and, and not deal with what's happening at home. So I'm thinking of countries where there's bad human rights records um, or or even where there's very little democracy that have been using climate change as a front. I, I'm thinking specifically of Gabon, for instance, where the Bongo family have been uh, in power for, for, for half a century, this oil rich nation where um, rich countries, um, my country, France has, 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 has taken a lot of gas from these countries. So you have companies like Total, like Shell, like BP, extracting oil and gas. Meanwhile, the president of Gabon is presenting itself as you know the the the, the forebearer of, of 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 protecting the forest and and being the lungs of africa that needs to be protected and, and so when we talk about carbon emission and carbon sinks and all these 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 things that are still very complex to i think my viewers we still need to break it down really simply into what's going on on a global effect and what is my country doing and what are they not saying at the press conferences? What is not being said? What is not being asked? And I think that's where local reporting is really important. Thanks, Nick. I'm gonna ask <clears throat> one question here that's come in over the RSVP. And we sort of touched on this earlier, but, but um, a reporter asked, if I've only got a few days at COP27, they're on the ground in Egypt. How do I make sure to spend that time wisely? Uh, Langi, you mentioned earlier, just stick with your own delegation, don't get distracted. And it is certainly true, it is a carnival of these things. And I don't mean that in a, in a sort of a jolly way, but there is so much going on, you simply cannot cover everything. But Carolyn, could you speak to that a little bit? If, if you only have a few days, how do you keep from going mad, keep your focus as a reporter on the ground there? Yeah, I think you have to, you know, think ahead of time about your your the storylines you want to follow and how you'll cover those over the course of the summit, um, and sort of which you know what stories you're going to do on what day and and try to stick to that. It is it's very tempting to like, you know, last last year I got a ticket to watch Obama speak and so I went to watch Obama speak because that was cool, right? <laughs> so it's hard to it's hard to um, not go, you know, try to follow everything and and uh, do lots of little hits on a bunch of stuff. But, um, you know, I think I think having a plan, sticking to it, being willing to, um, you know, uh, deviate from that if there's like some, you know, a moment of serendipity that's just like this great little story you can do, or you know, a big a big news event. Obviously, you want to have flexibility written <clears throat> into your plan to cover the unexpected news. But um, I think trying to, to, to have a plan and, and stick to it with the stories that you know will be impactful, maybe a bit original, um, you know, serve your audience so that you, you don't just see where all the other reporters are going and go there. Um, and yeah, and pace yourself. <laughs> what do you mean by that? I know what you mean, but tell us. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I think at the last COP, I did like a seven minute story each day uh, with radio. That's, it's too much. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I didn't have any time to go walk around and meet people to like find sources who I'd interviewed over the phone for years and introduce myself. Um, you know, I didn't have any time to like walk through the like whatever displays they have. I didn't even go in that hall. So, you know, you leave a little bit of time for your, you to do what is also really useful at these, which is just make contacts, make connections, meet people face to face. Um, so carve out a little bit of time for yourself and try to protect that um, to just chat with people, develop those relationships, maybe see something that gives you a new story idea that you hadn't thought about before um, and, and kind of 
you know, kind of be realistic about how much you can produce in a given period of time. I would also add, make sure that you're well rested before you get there because you will not get much rest while you're there. And you can do that because it's a very adrenalized situation. Um, and, but, you know, be rested, have some, um, you know, make sure you're eating well and all that stuff that your mama told you, because it's going to be, a, it's going to be an intense session. But I, I would totally underscore what Carolyn just said to leave some time because sometimes it's walking through the corridors and these just serendipitous meetings where you run into somebody who, you know, my God, it's the finance minister of France or whoever, and you literally can buttonhole them for 30 seconds and get a, a quote for your story that would never happen if you weren't there. So although much of our conversation today has been about how do you cover it remotely, and you can do a lot remotely. Um, if you are lucky enough to be there, that does bring certain advantages. So I want to ask all three of you kind of the same question here. And it's a fairly straightforward one. Uh, and let me start with you, Longing, and go back up the, the chain here. How many stories uh, does your news organization plan to cover? And will you be writing and, and broadcasting about COP27 all the way through? from the very start to the end, or do you anticipate uh, being more active uh, at one part or another of the conference? And again, as you answer this, uh, with a with a, a thought in mind that some newsrooms are not gonna be able to do as much coverage and how they would be approaching this. So Langi, why don't you start? I know, of course, the AP is a massive news organization, so it's gonna be a different answer. Sure, Mark. Um, so the AP is covering climate from various ways. So our bureaus are covering it from, you know, regional desks from their perspectives. Um, and the climate team will be covering throughout COP. Um, but leading up to COP27, our teams are also covering stories uh, in preparation. We're also doing collaborations with local newsrooms. So to highlight the stories that they're covering from the ground. Um, so it's going to be quite extensive uh, coverage from the AP with some of our senior writers and new writers on the ground. But um, before I, I pass the mic on to uh, the next panelist, I just want to give some advice um, in case this doesn't come back to me is, you know, one of the greatest challenges when you're at the COP is finding food at the venue and finding time to find the food. So someone asked me recently was, what's your greatest advice if you're going to go and survive a COP? Pack the snacks, yes. <laughs> Not just the snacks, but take food because you can actually waste a lot of time trying to find food. And being from Samoa, I did not appreciate nor like any of the food or know what they were in a lot of the venues. So I think I survived on like chips for a while. So I really advise that you sort that bit out so that you can survive the rest of, of the cup. Um, and I do agree with Carolyn's points on like making time um, for yourself uh, in that some of my greatest sources to date was from the first cup that I covered. And that's because I walked the halls. I looked at the various interesting booths and made contacts with them and their IPCC authors and negotiators now. So make those early contacts. Um, and then also, again, advice to, to fellow colleagues from the Global South is that um, this is the one place you will find the most experts at any given time in the history of climate change. So take that recorder and do as many interviews as you can on the issues that you want to cover because you can archive that and use those quotes at a later stage, but it's the only chance you will have to speak to some of these international experts. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Nick, Al Jazeera, how often and how uh, uh, how much uh, in volume do you guys plan covering? I'll, I'll give you, um, I'll give you the, I mean, I don't honestly know how many stories there'll be on it, but I can certainly tell you in, in total honesty, I can sense from, from the newsroom, this sense of climate fatigue um, and it's unfortunate. And it's maybe because we're not doing our jobs properly, but um, yeah, I, I think, it's really important. We're so, I mean, it's a story that's recur, it's not recurrent, it's just ongoing. And we revisit, we revisit themes over and over again of, of, of migration, 
um, the financial impact, et cetera. So it's, I think it's our job to make it, to, to confront this climate fatigue that I'm talking about uh, amongst certain newsroom. And, and I don't think it's just Al Jazeera, it might be other, other organizations too. Um, but I just wanted to add to what, what the panelists were saying. Um, I think it's really important to take stock, even as a journalist, um, the emotional impact that what, of, of what's going on, right? When there are certain decisions that are being taken to just like honor how you feel about it and, and what's going on and, and the potential impact that that has on a decision that is not going to be made, for instance. And, and what that will, how that will impact your life, but also the people that you're talking to. And often as journalists, we forget about our own emotions in, in the process. So busy trying to, 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 you know, to, to, to talk to others and to kind of tell their stories, but it's, it's really important, I think, to honor how we feel and what's going on and, and the trauma that there is in, in what's going on with, with, with our planet. And I think maybe perhaps that's the way to tell the story is to, 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 to come back, to recenter, and to be utterly present with, with the emotions at hand when it comes to covering climate change. That's such a wise intervention, Nick. Thank you so much. All of us need to be, you know, we are on the front lines of this and we need to take care of ourselves in order to do justice to the trauma that the people who are really experiencing it uh, are dealing with every day. So take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. Carolyn, quick last word from you, and then I'll close up again. Uh, how much is, does World Plan to be doing on this? Um, you know, I think we'll probably do an average of about a story a day with, with one or a couple leading up to it and then a couple wrapping up. Um, but, you know, I think it's a balance of not, um, you know, we, we, we make it, we intentionally cover climate change every day. Um, and this is part of that coverage, but I have to kind of rein myself in and remind myself that this is, um, you know, one important climate event every year, but there's a lot of big climate news. So we, you know, this doesn't need to plaster our airwaves. Um, rather, it should be part of our holistic cover of covering of climate change. If in a variety of ways, you know, diplomacy is one thing we cover, but then there's also, you know, the business side, there's, there's agriculture, there's like a whole bunch of different things. And the COP has an impact on all of those things, but it's not the only story. Um, and one more just like practical tip, in addition to food, which is a great thing to bring up, if you can get into the closing plenary, um, I recommend trying to be in there at least once when you cover COPs. Um, you know, all the negotiations are closed to press, but that is the one place where you see all the big players, you see all the big negotiators, like in these little huddles, and you really see the negotiations happen and the power plays that are happening on the ground. So you might need to go in there and not leave for eight hours. So that's another reason why you want to have food on you. But I think it's it's worth even just for your own edification. Um, to go to the closing plenary. Um, it's, I see a, a question here. Um, it's on the schedule. It'll be in, in all the, um, you know, lists of events, but it's the place where they, you know, vote to say yes to, but via consensus to the document that they're signing. And there's always a little, little bit of horse trading that happens there. So it can be cool to see that unfold. And that was the big dramatic moment at the end of COP26, where at the, literally at the last minute, Suddenly, the language was watered down from we're going to phase out coal to phase it down through an intervention, uh, joint intervention by China and India that left Alex Sharma, the COP26 president, literally in tears to see that shifted. And of course, remember, that's the big overarching story here. We came out of COP26, Sharma told us in the press conference that night, 1.5 degrees target is still alive, but it is on life support. And if you look at what's happened over the last 12 months, it sure as heck hasn't gotten any better. That's the big overarching question at COP27. Can we keep 1.5 at least within striking distance? So we're going to leave it at that. I urge all of you to join the Slack channel here at Covering Climate Now. Uh, look at our resources, sign up for our newsletter. Uh, I think it will help all of us to become better reporters and share back with us. That's, we're all on a learning process here of how to do justice to the biggest story of our time. I wanna close by thanking once again, our stellar group of panelists, uh, Nick Hawk from Al Jazeera, Car Carolyn Beeler from The World, and uh, Langia Poiva, uh, Cheryl Jackson from now the Associated Press. 
And on behalf of everyone at Covering Climate Now, I'm Mark Hertzgard, wishing you a very pleasant day.